So today we are going to talk about just a few of the common birds of prey species that we see here in Florida. Specifically, these are the species we're going to be going over today. Um, osprey, bald eagle, red-shouldered hawk, red-tailed hawk, and the swallowtail kite. And specifically, I'm going to play a call of each of these species so that we can begin to associate um, their call with the uh, species of bird, nesting, and then uh, diet, migration, and hazards and hopes, a little section that I titled. So before we jump in, I wanna make sure we're all on the same page with what exactly is a bird of prey. It's more or less synonymous with the term raptors. So people often use those two phrases interchangeably, but basically it's any bird that pursues other animals for food, kind of summarized in that way. And it can be broken up into two categories. There's the diurnal birds of prey, meaning they're most active during the day. So those are the hawks, eagles, vultures, and falcons. And I just bolded hawks and eagles because those are the ones we're gonna be talking about today. And then our nocturnal birds of prey are owls. And I'm not going over those today because we have already done a webinar on owls in the past. And Shannon will push out the link to that webinar in the chat in case any of you guys are interested in tuning into that later. So some key characteristics with birds of prey are uh, the hooked tipped beaks, which you can kind of see in this picture here. This is a red shouldered hawk. You can see it's got a very hooked beak, sharp curved claws, or what we refer to as talons. And they have extremely good eyesight for the majority of the birds of prey as much as four to eight times better eyesight than we have, which is obviously very helpful when they are pursuing other animals for their food. So before I really get into my presentation, we're going to throw a quick pop quiz question at you. So Shannon will pull this up on your screen again. So true or false, all Florida raptors are protected under the Federal Migratory Bird Treaty Act and under Florida law. <clears throat> so we're just giving everyone a chance to tune in. A few more left to answer. Okay, Shannon, I think you can go ahead and broadcast that. So pretty mixed results here. So the answer is actually true. They are protected under um, both the Federal Migratory Bird Treaty Act, which is a complicated thing to say, <laughs> and Florida law. And so basically this act protects not only the birds themselves, but also their nests and their eggs. The actual law, if you were to go you know, dive into it, gets a lot more specific than that, but they didn't want to just protect the physical bird, but also um, these other, you know, the nests and the eggs to ensure that the species overall is protected and um, hopefully their populations will recover. <laughs> and we have some success stories which we'll talk about. So first off, we're gonna talk about the osprey. So I'm gonna play a quick call just Many of you guys are probably familiar with this call. Oops. So it's a very, very distinct call, and that is the call of an osprey, if you've ever heard it. So sometimes it's just really fun to learn birds by their call. You might not often always see them, but you can recognize and identify birds simply just by hearing their sound. So in terms of nesting for the osprey, we've already passed their nesting season. It's at the very start of the year, typically January through April, anytime in between there. And they're pretty particular and unique in terms of their nesting. They really like open surroundings uh, from where they're gonna place their nest. So if you've ever watched an osprey approach their nest, they kind of do like their approach, they co come down before they come and land up on their nest site. And so that's often why they like the open surrounding from um, around their nest site. And one of the reasons that they've really taken on to these human built platforms, which I think I have a picture on the next slide of those and probably many of you guys have seen those. 
but they'll also take advantage of snags, which are standing dead trees, and then, you know, treetops as well in a natural setting. But they've really, really adapted to urban environments. I see them on light poles and those uh, human built pr platforms as well. So for ospreys in particular, the males are the ones that find the nest site and collect the materials for the nest. And then the females are the ones that put it all together and make it look pretty. <laughs> uh, and they have anywhere from one to four eggs that they lay every year. And they are quite territorial of their nest site once it's been established. And that pretty much goes for most birds of prey, but we'll talk a little bit more specifically about the hawks uh, when we get there, or the, I should specify the red-shouldered and red-tailed hawks. Because the osprey is also called the fish hawk, and that's due to the fact that pretty much 99% of their diet is made up of fish, which is very unique in the bird of prey world. Eagles are probably kind of next in line for fish being high up on their diet, but ospreys are doing the majority of their own catching of fish. And we'll talk about that when we get to the eagles. Um, and if your diet is mostly fish, then you would hope that you're a pretty good fisherman. And with ospreys, I've seen different statistics from anywhere from every one in four dives that they make to get fish will be successful to as much as 70% success rate. So either way, it's really fun to watch if you ever get the chance to watch them hunt. They do this awesome hovering kind of in search for the fish. And then as soon as they spot them, they go into this steep dive. It's really, really awesome to watch. So if you live near a body of water, you probably have ospreys nearby. And um, in terms of their migration, so this is a map. This is from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, a really, really great resource um, for any bird information. This is one of my go-to sources. I got permission to use these maps with the appropriate credit there. So you can see in Florida, we have ospreys here year round but they can be found all throughout North America, whether it's they're breeding or just migrating through um, or overwintering. So we're fortunate that we get to have them here year round. And in terms of hazards and hopes, so I talked about their um, protection and a lot of that has to do with historical activities. So pesticides were a really big uh, cause for concern with ospreys as well as eagles, especially in relation to DDT, if you're familiar with that. Um, but also with ospreys, one thing that they're finding is as plastic pollution increases, these birds are starting to use materials in their nests from um, like plastic materials in their nests, which are causing entanglement issues. So that's another cause for concern with osprey, as well as development, which pretty much goes for any species, any wildlife species in general, but it's with ospreys impacting their potential nesting habitats. But with these constructed nest platforms, which you can see on your screen here, there's been great, great um, adoption of these by the ospreys and recovery as a result of that. So we're very fortunate that that has worked out and the ospreys seem to be adapting pretty well in general to urban environments. And now that you know DDT has been banned and we're trying to help with some of the pollution efforts. So any beach cleanups you can do as well will be helpful for any bird of prey and really any species that live along the beach or ocean. So switching over to the bald eagle, which can be confused with the osprey. And we touch on that in one of our previous webinars as well, kind of how to tell the two apart, especially when eagles are immature. But let's hear the bald eagle call because a lot of people aren't familiar with this one. It's a pretty cool call. It's not necessarily one that people would associate with this like very intimidating looking massive bird. It's kind of like a wimpy call, a lot of people think. Um, but once you get familiar with that call, you can't really um, confuse it with any other species. So when it comes to nesting for bald eagles, it's much later in the year from the osprey, though it can go um, into February. So. Starting in October is usually the earliest they'll start nesting, but again, all the way through February, anytime in between there. 
And they, and Florida particularly, really like tall pine trees. So if you live in an area where you have tall pines, definitely take a look around to see if you can spot a massive nest of an eagle. And I'll share another resource with you as well to locate eagle nests. And they typically don't nest like in the very top of the tree, but below the, can of, uh, below the kind of crown portion of the tree and near the trunk because they need that support for their massive, massive nests. You can see here some of the larger nests are anywhere from five to six feet in diameter. So like we could go up and curl up in an eagle nest. It's pretty incredible if you think about it. And the nest more often than not um, can be reused and they're added to, which is how they get to be. They don't start off at five to six feet in diameter, but over time, they'll slowly add on to these. And not only do they get wider, but they get much, much heavier. Male and females are both contributing to the nest building process and um, at least collecting the materials. The females are the ones doing the arranging of the nest and kind of weaving the sticks together. And the eagles have only one to three eggs um, when they are nesting. So this is a really neat site. Shannon will push up the link for this as well if you guys are interested in finding out if you have any eagles nesting in your area. You can zoom in to your particular county or even city or neighborhood and then each of those dots are clickable so it tells you when it was active. It gives you details on each of the nests. So really, really cool resource if you guys are interested in that. And I kind of alluded to the diet of bald eagles when I was talking about the osprey. So fish do make up a good portion of the diet with eagles. The difference between the eagles and the osprey is that eagles are thieves. And they aren't doing their own fishing most of the time. <coughs> Excuse me. So although they're like our national emblem, they're thieves. And they often are thieves of these poor osprey that work very hard to catch their fish. So they'll either harass them midair, causing the osprey to drop their fish, or they'll actually go and steal it straight out of their talons. So it's, um, you can take that for what it is with, with the eagles, but it works for them and that's how they get their fish. Other things that make up their diet are actually other bird species, all sorts of reptiles, amphibians, invertebrates, and then other uh, mammal species, things like squirrels and rabbits and things like that. So their diet is quite varied, but fish are number one. And the image down here, just in case you guys aren't familiar, this is an immature bald eagle. So you can see they don't look quite like what we think of typically when we think of an eagle with the white head and white tail. So you can see how that might be confused for an osprey. And in terms of migration, again, here in Florida, Eagles are typically year-round. You can see throughout m most of North America, you can find bald eagles. Most of them will be breeding in the very, very northern part up into Canada. But here, again, we're blessed that we have eagles year-round. Ooh, another pop quiz for you. Okay. So Shannon will pull this one up for you guys. So true or false? The bald eagle is currently listed under the Endangered Species Act. <clears throat> okay. I think you can go ahead and close it, Shannon, most people. So again, a pretty even split. I feel like I should get a drum roll going. <laughs> so this is actually false. And the key word there is currently because uh, they were historically listed under and protected under the Endangered Species Act, but are no longer. So historically, and even somewhat still today, some of the hazards that face bald eagles were trapping, shooting, and poisoning, again, a lot from pesticides, things like DDT. Lead poisoning from hunter shot prey. So like if a squirrel was to get shot and not collected by the hunter and then an eagle was to find it, 
or, or some scenario like that, the lead from that shot that was in the squirrel that the eagle then eats can cause lead poisoning, collisions with vehicles. That again, unfortunately goes for a lot of species of birds, as well as buildings, development again, and pollution, particularly the big spill in Alaska back in the late uh, 1980s had a really big impact on eagle populations. But again, due to banning of DDT, protection under the Endangered Species Act, the eagles have really been able to rebound and just, you know, nature does its magic. And so we have really strong populations. So they are no longer listed and don't need the protection currently under the Endangered Species Act. Okay, so for the red-shouldered hawk and red-tailed hawk, we're gonna look at them together because I wanna also show tips on how you can tell the two species apart. The first sound though that I'm gonna play is of the red-shouldered hawk. We'll play the red-tailed hawk call later and you'll see why. So this is the red-shouldered hawk call. So again, it's a pretty distinct call with the red-shouldered hawk. Excuse me. And this is an image of them both in flight, which it might seem pretty obvious here how to tell them apart, but when it's actually live and flying and they're just, it's just a quick flash, sometimes it's not as easy to tell or if they're really high up in the sky. So on the top, we have the red-shouldered hawk. The bottom, we have the red-tailed hawk. So I guess first things I should say, generally speaking, the red-tailed hawk is a larger hawk, but again, that's not really easy to tell unless they're sitting side by side, which is pretty rare to have that happen. So if they are in flight, there's a couple things you can look for. The first is with the red-shouldered hawk, we, they have what we call like windows at the tips of their wings. So there's like this lighter patch at the tip of both of their wings. So you can see that when you're looking up from underneath. And then in terms of the wings with the red-tailed hawk, it's more or less just like black and brown mottled wings. There's nothing super distinct about their wings. So the next thing you can look for is the tail, which is kind of a dead giveaway with the name. With the red-tailed hawk, at least in mature species, you're gonna see kind of this rust-colored tail. Sometimes that's very distinct and obvious but it contrasts quite a bit from the tail of the red-shouldered hawk. So you can see here, it's basically dark and light bands alternating along the tail, which again is very fanned out in both species. <clears throat> then another thing you can look for, whether they're in flight or perched, is looking at the breast of these birds. So on a red-shouldered hawk, the red from their shoulders also extends to their chest, and it's kind of broken up by these white bars compared to the breast of a red-tailed hawk, which is mostly white, but they kind of have this strip in the middle of their chest of brown modeling, which you can see here and, and down here in this bottom picture. So just some tips on how to tell those two apart from each other. In terms of nesting, they are pretty similar in terms of timing and the rest of the details. So more or less the beginning half of the year, there's a little bit longer window for nesting for red-shouldered hawks. But these two species are both very aggressive when it comes to defending their nest. And that's not only from other species of birds and other animals, but also people. So they are known for dive bombing at people. So if you know you have either one of these species nesting in your area, it's really best to kind of keep your distance and stay away. And certainly if you are getting attacked, avoid that area. <laughs> Pretty easy solution there. In terms of where they nest in the trees, this is really where they uh, vary. So with a red-shouldered hawk, you can see it's really below the forest canopy, kind of the dense vegetation at the top. And usually in the crotch, again, of a main trunk to really support their nest. And they're often found near a body of water. And so actually the picture that's in the background on this slide is a picture right here at my office location, which is Booker Creek Preserve in Tarpon Springs. So we have the creek right nearby where they decided to build this nest. And again, it's like right in the crotch of the tree below the canopy, just like it says in the books. 
As for red-tailed hawks, they are more in the crowns of very tall trees. They like to have that good view of the landscape and the area around them. As for building the nest for both species, male and female are involved in the whole process, collecting the materials and building the nest. Sometimes they'll reuse the same nest, sometimes they won't. So sometimes if they are reusing the nest, they'll kind of just touch it up and refurbish it. And both male and female are involved in that process. And in terms of number of eggs, again, pretty similar. Usually not only one with the red-shouldered hawk, anywhere from two to five, and one to five with the red-tailed hawk. We, although we don't know how many eggs were laid in our nest here, we ended up with two hatchlings. So that are, I'm pretty sure now fledged. I haven't gone and checked on them in a week or so, but it's very, very cool. So also diet is pretty similar, though like I mentioned before, the red-tailed hawk is generally a larger hawk compared to the red-shouldered hawk. So when it comes to the mammals that they will feed on, red-tailed hawks will more often go for a little bit larger prey than a red-shouldered hawk. So some of the mammals, like the larger mammals, the rabbits and squirrels, would be more likely to be captured by a red-tailed hawk versus a red-shouldered hawk. But otherwise, you can see red-shouldered hawk will feed on everything from small lizards, snakes, uh, amphibians, and even other birds, though less often, especially less often than red-tailed hawks. And red-tailed hawks are even known to eat dead animals. So take that for what it is. <laughs> in terms of migration for these two species, you can see again here in Florida, we're blessed that we have these species year round. The range for red-shouldered hawk is much less than the red-tailed hawk. With the red-shouldered hawk, you know, occupying much of the eastern part of North America and the United States. And then you can see the red-tailed hawk is pretty much all throughout all of North America with again, breeding populations up in the northern part. Okay, so I mentioned that we're holding off on the red-tailed hawk call. And I'm gonna, well, this video is gonna tell you why. So let me get this situated for you guys. Last week about buying Twitter insurance. Hey, I'm John. And I'm Erin. Cone and I work for the Norfolk Botanical Gardens, and we have a bald eagle cam. And I hate to break it to you on the little spoof that you did about Twitter and shirts when you showed an eagle fly across the screen and you had a call that was actually not a bald eagle call. Get your Twitter insurance to cover your tweets and your ad. That was a red-tailed hawk call. This is the sound of a red-tailed hawk. And this is actually what a bald eagle sounds like. You made a mistake. <laughs> so I love that clip. Um, and you'll often see this in a lot of movies. Anytime there's like a big bird flying over, they will often play the call of a red-tailed hawk, regardless of what species is flying over. So kind of your fun fact for the day. And then we'll wrap up talking about the swallowtail kite, which is one of my favorite bird of prey species. They're just so fun to watch. <clears throat> and we only have them in the state for a portion of the year, so it's really fun and exciting once they make their way here. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Their call is also pretty distinct and one that I will often hear and then be um, called to you know, look up and then spot them later. So let's hear their call. So super cute call in my personal opinion. <laughs> okay, and then in terms of their diet, we're gonna end with, this is the last pop quiz, I promise, um, in asking what uh, makes up the majority of a swallowtail kite's diet. Is it reptiles, baby birds, amphibians, or flying insects? Changing your boats. 
All right, give you a couple more seconds. There's still a few people voting. Okay, Shannon, you can go ahead and close it. So the majority of you got it correct. It is flying insects, believe it or not. Uh, the other species listed here are also make up portions of their diet occasionally, but the majority is flying insects. <clears throat> so again, number one, flying insects, small vertebrates make up the other portion of their diet, things like frogs, lizards, even eat nestling birds, which is always sad, but you know, that's, the world goes around, right? <laughs> Circle of life. And then also snakes, which is always awesome to see birds of prey with snakes in their talons. The super, super cool thing about swallowtail kites, and probably one of the many reasons that I think they're so awesome, is they hunt on the wing, which means basically as they're flying, they are hunting. So they're not necessarily swooping down and, and hunting on the ground in any way, shape, or form that it's all in the air, which is crazy, or like right off of a tree branch. And in addition, once they catch their food, then they're eating it in midair. So they're like doing yoga midair as well. So it's super awesome if you ever get to see them in action doing that. And what really aids them to do that is their swallow tail, which is where they get their name. And that basically serves as a rudder so that they can make super sharp turns, which as you can imagine is very helpful when you're hunting and feeding mostly on flying insects. So super awesome. If you guys have not seen a swallowtail kite, I encourage you to see, you know, talk to your local Audubon group and see if you can get out and find some because they're really, really cool. So in terms of their nesting, this is slightly different from the other birds of prey species that we've talked about because they aren't here year round. So they arrive typically early March. I saw my first one at the very end of February this year, and then they start nesting in the summer, so June through August, and near top of cypress or pine trees, so somewhat similar to bald eagles. They like to have really, really tall trees. Both male and females are involved in building the nest, and what's also unique about these birds, so they're flying here from, well, I'll get to those details, from far away. <laughs> but then they typically are building a new nest every year. So it's just like a ton of energy, these crazy birds. And they are very territorial of their nest site. Once it's established, they'll often fly in circles over it to kind of fend off from any potential threats. And they only weigh, weigh lay from one to three eggs every year. So this is their map of their migration, which you can see is very different from the other maps that we've looked at. And you can see Florida is orange, so they are only here for breeding purposes. And then they will migrate actually back down to South America. So they make that trip every year. And some species down there will remain down there year round, but we do get lots of swallowtail kites um, here in Florida. We're actually the number one state in the United States for swallowtail kite populations, which is really neat. Historically, you can see here, it was a much larger area, 16 states, but uh, it's now down to only seven states where they're found with, again, Florida being number one. So shooting and hunting was really historically, again, way back in the 1900s, early 1900s was a huge threat to these species, but habitat loss and disturbed roosting areas, they're really, really sensitive birds. So um, if if any of these are impacting them, habitat loss or dis disturbance of their roost sites, it's really, really negatively impacting their overall populations. But with targeted efforts and Audubon groups are really proactive about this. I know at least in Pinellas County, there's a lot of outreach and education on swallowtail kites. So targeted habitat protection can help to protect the populations and breeding populations of swallowtail kites that we still have. So I'm looking at the time. Okay, just got a couple more slides and then hopefully we'll have a few more minutes for questions at the end. So just some tips on how you guys can help birds of prey in general, not only the species I talked about today, but other species. We've done a webinar on creating wildlife habitat. Now, many of us, unless you have tons of acreage, can't necessarily support a bird of prey like on our site and everything that they need to survive. But if we can provide thinking about like the overall food chain, the smaller species, 
that they feed upon, if we can support those populations in our yard, then we're ultimately helping the bird of prey population. So this webinar that we've done in the past, which again, Shannon will push out the link for that, 10 tips to creating backyard habitat, not only helps these birds of prey, but all wildlife species. And one thing to consider is if you do have an issue with uh, specifically like rats and mice that these birds of prey would often feed on, there's a big concern with poisons that are being used on the rats. And then if the birds of prey are then consuming these rats that have been poisoned, it's causing the ultimate death of these birds of prey. So there's a lot of research going on with rodenticides and which ones are uh, less impacting in that way. They're effective for killing the, the rodents and the rats, but not killing the birds of prey if they then consume them. So um, FWC re recommends Quintox, which is listed at the very bottom of your screen as a rodenticide if you need to resort to that. But the university, you know, that's always a last resort is using chemicals and poisons. So Shannon will also push out a link to an EDIS publication that kind of walks you through a lot more detail than I'll have time to go through. But basically, you know, you start off with how do we prevent the problem in the first place with rodents through rodent proofing, just making sure your yard and inside of your home is, you know, sanitary. <laughs> then again, attracting natural predators to help control them is a great way to uh, manage your populations of rodents. Trapping, you can also do kind of the old school, we think of mouse trap. And then again, last resort would be to use chemicals. And typically we recommend not doing it yourself unless you've done your research, but you know, contacting an exterminator to help. So that was just some of the main information. I asked a few people what particularly they would be interested to know about these species. And that's what I tried to touch on today. So we talked about the osprey, bald eagle, red-shouldered hawk, red-tailed hawk, and swelled-tailed kite. And I want to thank you guys so much for tuning in for our first Wildlife Wednesday webinar of our series for this year. 